Tekariahum. Are you ready? All righty. So I'm going to bring, welcome happily Yolanda back to the microphone. Jump. Um, I just want to make sure. Can everybody hear me through this mic? If I speak, like, is this loud enough? Yeah. Okay. And there's just a small group, too, so I don't, I don't have to try that hard, maybe. <laughs> um, I already gave my introduction this morning, but just I'll do it again. My name is Yolanda Pushitaniqua, and I am Meskwaki, Meskwaki from Tama, Iowa. We are in central Iowa, and our tribe is... Our tribe is a small community of about 1,400 enrolled members, and we have a, our our language is in an endangered state. So I grew up in a home with two fluent speakers, and this is um, sim the similar um, effect is seen in each family throughout my community, where the people my generation and younger were not becoming fluent speakers of the language. So that's a pretty common phenomena in my community. And um, what I'm gonna talk about today is how I came to study linguistics and um, some of the influence it has had on me, my learning, and um, my current work. So um, I will, oh, and just uh, another bit about my introduction. I am a recent student to graduate student of the University of Minnesota at the Twin Cities campus. I studied in the Institute of Linguistics and I received my MA in 2016, so I just finished school. Uh, let's see. So my interest in linguistics developed over the course of many years, and um, it's, a, it's a very long, fascinating story, I assure you. You can ask Sarah here. I regaled my whole um, background to her on the way from the airport last night. But um, basically, you know, a lot of different um, small interactions that I had with linguists over the years um, drew in my interest more and more. And there were many um, points where I wondered, you know, what is it that linguists know? What do they know about this, these languages? And what is it that, how do they know so much about my language? Because I started to learn, um, get to know linguists who work on Meskwaki language. Um, in my community, we didn't really have a lot of um, opportunity to, to purposefully learn the language. Even though the language was around us all the time, every day, it still was um, difficult to um, jump right into language learning, and we had never experienced a need for that as a community and as a people. And as young people, we didn't really have maybe the courage or the um, motivation that it took to to like jump right in it and be you know self guide our own learning. We didn't know anything about that. All that we knew was that there was this um, situation at hand where we didn't know how to you know improve our fluency. And the adults in our community, you know, they definitely wanted us to learn the language and they wished that we'd be fluent too, but they themselves also, you know, the, the solution wasn't readily available. It wasn't obvious. And so these questions that I had and, you know, the um, wondering what's going to happen to us because we don't know our language, um, where do we go? There wasn't really any sort of solution and it wasn't really something that we talked about that much. So every once in a while th in different scenarios, um, language I saw, I came to understand what language preservation was about. That was the first um, terminology I heard for this phenomenon when I was asked to do a research project in the year 2000. So this was about 16 years ago now. <laughs> um, in the year 2000, I did a mini research project and I learned about language loss and endangered languages. And I, that was the first time anybody had ever, you know, around me talked about or I, first time I ever heard or knew that this same phenomenon was happening in other communities around the world. I had no idea. Like, we really, I just thought it was just us, just our people were going through this. And then, um, so I, through that research program, I heard a little bit about what linguists were saying about the state of endangered languages. And that was just really interesting to me. It was just um, surprising to know that there were people who had, who had some awareness of language out there. And I wasn't sure yet if that was something, a type of knowledge that we needed or not. 
Um, fast forward to 2008, I attended my first linguistics talk, and that was actually at a symposium in my community where a bunch of researchers of all, all things Meskwaki, you know, researchers came and talked about their um, findings, and one was a linguist by the name of Amy Dahlstrom, and she gave a talk on Meskwaki, and it was just really fascinating and surprising, again, to hear um, this non-Meskwaki person, a non-native person at that speaking my language and the way that she was talking, it was very clear, like I could really understand what she was saying and that was, I'd never seen such a thing. And it just blew my mind and I thought, oh my gosh, what does this lady know? What is it about these linguists and what do they do that they know how to, how does she know how to analyze these words? So I met her and talked with her and she answered all my questions, but I still had more questions, you know, of course, I'm like, I, I think there's something to this linguist thing. And in 2010, I was actually asked by my tribal council to be the first employee of our tribal language program. And that's where um, my, I guess, my final career change happened. And I, from that point on, I was just really committed to learning language and doing something to better our, our language situation. So as the director of the program, I really went through a lot in just a short two and a half years that I was with the program. We did um, a lot of language program. I researched, um, did started to do some, you know, research about what linguistics was. Um, we researched education and technology. We um, administered a curriculum um, grant for our K-12 school. We got training in for our K-12 teachers. I got to attend um, a lot of trainings on immersion-based language learning practices, and so all of these things were just really um, helpful and you know really stimulating to get excited about all these different directions we could go, but still wondering how can we pull all that together? You know, there is a lot of information out there in the world, and how do we pull this together and affect our community? So we, you know, we've done um, a pilot immersion program. We did a language nest in the summer of 2012, and that has since flourished to full time. You know, we did that in the summer. Now it's actually integrated into our three-year-old and uh, pre-K programs where we, we have immersion now at school. So that's, that's really neat that, um, I was, I was really happy and proud to be a part of that in the beginning. Um, we did some other fun stuff too. We had a conference, I had an awareness conference, and we did language tables every week to give an opportunity for language learners and speakers to come together. So there was a lot of activity that we had going on. Um, <clears throat> while I was with the language program, I really came to focus on or understood that we had certain needs and including, you know, especially the training of teachers, improving, somehow improving, you know, our education of our, you know, ourselves in our tribal language. How do we improve that? Um, we needed more collaborative support within the tribal community um, and we needed a strategy that had some sort of proven results. You know, I am a believer that, you know, if there are results out there, seek out what that person or group has done, what was it that made them successful? And one thing that really caught my attention, and this is really where I jumped into linguistics, was that I learned about my own writing system, our, our Meskwaki writing system has a few um, weaknesses. There are some areas that need attention to the writing system itself, and that was where it really kicked off and I understood that I needed to um, pursue some, some sort of information or education in linguistics. So, um, what I started off with was, I'm gonna zoom in on this so you can see a little bit better, but basically um, it was an issue with the, the phonetics in our language. We have some, um, you know, some phonemes, some speech sounds that are actually important. They are like letters of the alphabet, right? They're, they're important pieces of the language, but they're not represented on paper in our, um, our writing system. So on the left hand side, the Meskwaki alphabet, this is how we currently, our current standard writing system is represented by what we call a syllabary. It's just a list of um, supposedly all of the syllables that occur in our language. And this is what we are taught, you know, as we're growing up. This is how we write, you know, our language. And um, unfortunately, what in actuality, and nobody, no, I don't know if, you know, I can't say for sure that any fluent speakers did not know this, but it seems to me like not a lot of people were aware of this, is that we do have these speech sounds that are really important to um, any word. You need to mark one thing is vowel length. The length of our vowels is really important in knowing, differentiating one word from another. 
Another thing is um, the letter H or aspiration um, is important too for when a learner like myself is trying to pronounce a word, I need to know where that H is. And that's especially important in the case of we have pre-aspirated consonants, basically meaning we have an H before something like a K or a P or a T. And those aren't represented in our writing system. As you can see, we don't have any H's on our um, syllabary. But when in the upper right-hand corner, when I was working with, you know, looking through old documents and doing some of this research, I came across this crazy looking writing system. And I had no idea like why, I, I knew that there had to be a reason, right? Like why, why do they feel like they need to put all these funny looking characters in there? There's a reason for behind all of that and I don't know what this is, right? I, I can't even read this. And sometimes I would stare at it and I would find a few words that I could recognize, but I still didn't, just really didn't get it. And you know, looking at that, that's what really pushed me to take my first intro class. I took my intro to linguistics class um, once I stumbled upon these old documents. And down below on the right is just a one, um, one line sample from um, an Ives Goddard document in a story. This is how Ives writes out, he, um, this is the orthography he uses when he wants to um, mark out the the clitics from the rest of the word. Let's see what else does he have. He has vowel length included in there and he has the letter H included in there. And again, so I wasn't familiar with how, what that was. And so to me, I actually couldn't even read that. And um, those were things that were really intriguing to me. I really, really wanted to know what was going on with this and why is there a discrepancy between the way we write and how this was. So that's where I um, began to take my intro class and I learned about, um, like we heard today from Monica, the you know phonetics, phonology, the sound system. I learned IPA, the International Phonetic Alphabet, and I started experimenting myself with different ways to mark these um, vowel lengths and mark the letter H. And so I tried out these different you know orthographies just as a practice and to see how it looked. And um, ultimately I decided, you know, okay, this is, this is really good. I'm so glad I stumbled upon this and it gave me a lot of confidence and hope because before when you're stuck with, um, you know, a very limited syllabary that doesn't mark some of those, it actually makes it really inaccessible. You can't learn when you, um, you don't even realize that there's a difference between, you know, a long A and a short A. You really have to know the difference. And nobody had ever explained that to me. And in fact, you know, I go and I now explain this to my fellow learners who are younger and they appreciate it and they understand what I'm saying and they're like, oh, that makes sense. You know, that would re be really helpful. And um, I've explained the same thing to, to fluent speakers and I know some of them, they understand and some of them, they don't respond. You know, they just kind of stare at me and they don't, they don't give me a response. So. For a very long time, I couldn't under, you know, I was just like, I don't know what they think. <laughs> and my uncle told me, I think they probably know that you're onto something, but they don't want to have to like relearn how to read and write, which is, you know, that's a legitimate fear, but it's, it's not that hard. It's actually pretty easy to <laughs> learn how to do that. So um, from while I was um, in the language department is when I still, I had just taken that intro class. Um, it took me, you know, all this time, a number of years to finally make it to grad school. And, you know, I finally did. I got into um, University of Minnesota and I started in 2013. And so that was my first full experience. And I was, I was regretful that I didn't find my way to that many years before. I was regretful that I didn't realize back in 2000 that I was going to love linguistics. I wish I would have jumped right on it. But I was just finishing up my undergrad in finance. So I didn't feel like I could go back and start over. I thought it was too late. But it wasn't. <laughs> so in you know studying linguistics, obviously we have you know a number of um, areas within the study of linguistics. Like we heard again from um, Wesley and uh, Monica, you know morphology and syntax. They're so important. They're really really important to any language that we're studying. Um, the grammatical structure of a language. You know that's basically mapping it out, giving ourselves a blueprint of what we're looking at. And I feel like, you know, before it was kind of like having, you're just in a dark room and you don't know where you're going. You're just like feeling around for whatever. You don't know what you're gonna find. You don't know how to find it. But, you know, giving you a flashlight for that dark room is kind of what linguistics did for me. Or kind of giving me a blueprint for what it is that I need to lay out and approach in, in my learning. Um, phonology, uh, yeah, the phonology really helped. Phonology is, again, just the, um, 
kind of the sound structure, the not just the sounds that we make in the language, but what sounds sound like together when you put them together and the rules about them. Well, before I had studied linguistics, you know, I was like many of my um, fellow second language learners and young people in the community. Um, our speech is a little bit colored by English, and so we had a, I, I know I had a harder time pronouncing those pre-aspirated consonants, so like muk, like bear, muk, there's, there's a H before that K. But I think, you know, when we're young and we're growing up, we just say muk, oh, a muk, look, there's a muk, you know, something like that. And you don't, um, you don't emphasize it as much. And so those lang that language is kind of, you know, transferring, dropping some of that. And um, as one of the um, ladies here was talking about, when you have elder fluent speakers in the community and your community is full of fluent people, it's really important to them that you sound authentic and, and right. And when we have very few or no second language speakers, you know, starting to learn, it's really shocking to fluent speakers to hear somebody talking, you know, so with such an American accent, right? They, it's, it's so important to them that we are authentic sounding. So when I studied phonology and I began to understand these pre-aspirated consonants and that they even exist, that's where I was able to start practicing it. I mean, I actually wasn't aware of those things. And then I would play on my iPod, you know, this language. And now that I was aware of the pre-aspirated consonants, I would hear them and then I started doing it, you know, more and more and more forcefully. And um, I would kind of go to my language tables and mimic like I, I said to myself, you know, I'm gonna pretend like I'm talking like an old person. And I would do that, you know, with our, my elders. And then they were like, yeah, yeah, that's it, that's it. You sound really good, you know. So that was my key. I felt like I, I really improved my own um, speech by, by practicing that and applying that, what I had learned from school. Uh, let's see. And semantics, oh, semantics is just a lot more complex. I, I'm not gonna cover semantics. I have, I have a couple examples, though, of morphology and syntax, and we had already seen some examples from Monica, so I don't know if I, I can just go through these really fast. Um, another, yeah, another phenomena that happened that I didn't, I wasn't aware of, but thanks to linguistics, I now understand like what's going on, is we have semi-vowel elision, which is basically like W's and Y's are dropping out. So like in our really old language, our old talk, we would have something like eh, baui nenushau, eh, baui nenushau. Like there's a W there, but with um, modern, younger, fluent speakers, maybe who are like, like my dad's age, um, my dad's generation, you know, they, they'll say something like, eh, by nenosha. So there's no W there at all. And so in the written form, if you're a learner and you're looking at materials that have, you know, you've gotten from school or whatever, sometimes you see the W there and sometimes you don't. And if you're not even aware that that's a possibility, it, you're not gonna um, pick up on anything via paper at all. I mean, you're just, you're not gonna pick it up because it's, it's so, um, kind of scattered and random as to whether those semivowels are included or not. So that's pretty common. That's a common thing that happens right now within our speakers. Our current speech community, some people have those semivowels and some don't. But now that I'm aware of it, I can totally read it. You know, I can figure it out and it doesn't even affect me anymore whether they included them or not. Uh, let's see. And again, Monica gave a example too of our really long words. Learning morphology, learning that morphology exists and that there's a way that you can break up a huge word because our language is, it's, it's very morphologically complex and our words are very, very long. I know like Diné and As you know, Athabascan languages are just so, I think they're even more complex than ours. <laughs> you know, there are so many little parts to these languages, right? And in morphology, basically you're breaking apart all those little pieces and finding out what those pieces mean individually. And those are basically your word structure. And you know, in English, it's not like that at all. We have very little morphology in English, so we don't have to worry about knowing how to do that. But in our Algonquian languages, you know, we have huge long words and every single piece is a part of what is normally a sentence in English. So that's where it's at. That's where we need to be learning. And you know, that just gaining that experience and understanding of linguistics really helped me feel reassured Again, I felt, you know, like it's possible to actually learn our language because I think we grew up having no clue that it was going to be possible for us to even do that. 
Um, being in the linguistics community and the university community, you know, of course, I had the opportunity to do a lot more research of other, the, the linguists who study my language. I'm, I'm really fortunate to be from a language that has caught the attention of a few, you know, a handful of really dedicated linguists out there. And, you know, even though they're, they're not, you know, local in our community, but they've done extensive work. And the products of their work include lexicon, dictionaries. We have a lot of, um, there's a manuscript of a um, grammar, and there are so many articles, and there's a lot of old publishings from about 100 years ago that um, they all kind of, they give you know a lot of information about our language, and not all tribal languages have that much documentation on them. So I, I'm really fortunate for that. Um, but our language being as complex as it is, it when I see it from this lens, from the lens of a linguist, it's like, no wonder we had such a hard time learning it as young people. No wonder we struggled and we're, you know, don't even know where to start. So basically, you know, looking at my own language, I was able to understand the four verbal types of any Algonquian language. You know, we have animate and transitive verbs, like he walks. We have um, VT, uh, VIIs, inanimate and transitive verbs, like it's light outside, wasei. Um, VTAs are verb transitive animate, um, he likes her, minwanama, and um, transitive inanimate, he likes it, minwanatum. Those um, four different ways, those are the four basic verb types, but under that, you know, within each verb type, they're inflected by person, by, you know, who's doing the action, who's receiving the action. And that might be common for a lot of um, native languages, uh, you know, but we all, they're, they're all different. So I don't know, this is, this is how ours is. And none of this information was accessible to me prior to me studying linguistics, because I, even though I was aware of some of those, um, those publishings being out there, it's still hard to access them. It's hard to read them and understand them and to know what they're saying. So being the student and being able to then read and look into that literature really helped me get that type of understanding. Um, morphological complexity, oh yeah. So yeah, we have, um, like I had showed that example, huge, huge words with lots of morphemes. So I just wanna fast forward to, just to save on time, jump right to um, after finishing you know, school, I, I actually already had, I transitioned while I was to, um, while I was finishing my last year of school, I began to do subcontract work for um, our sister tribe's language program. And so just as I was um, wrapping up my studies, I transitioned to become the, the linguist for the SOC language program. And um, what that looks like is basically, so Sauk language is um, our close, our most closest related tribe in our language family. So Sauk and Muskwaki, we actually have historical and cultural connections, you know, towards the end of, um, right before the reservations were assigned to us. You know, we resided together, we traveled together, migrated together, and have a lot of, you know, relations culturally. So, <clears throat> Um, as soon as I joined the language department back in 2010, I got to know them because they had their language department and we began to share um, experiences and resources. And so while I was still a graduate student, we worked together on a language camp, um, summer culture camp for the kids. And we did that in 2015 and then we did it again in 2016. And then over the course of the year, I started to do a little bit of subcontract work for them and by the time I finished um, my schooling, then I was able to just join them full time. And the reason I did that, I mean, we have our own language program, which like I said, I was a part of before. Um, we, we have the ability, I mean, I, I actually still reside in my community. The nice thing about this is I'm actually free to work within my own community still, working on a program that is for my people in, um, developing a program that's gonna support our tribal language, but it, it, the collaborative aspect of it is that we are sharing resources, and resources meaning, um, so the SOC language department is based in Stroud, Oklahoma, and they started a few years ago an effort with Bacon College, which is um, based in Muskogee, Oklahoma. Bacon College has um, allowed for them to create a space um, called the Center for Tribal Languages and Jacob Manitawa Bailey, who is currently speaking next door, um, who's my, my boss, um, he 
he was my boss until he's, he's as of this week, <laughs> he's uh, moving into a different position. But um, he is the director of Center for Tribal Languages. And under the Center for Tribal Languages, there are four, currently four um, different tribes that offer a program where a learner, a college age learner can take master apprentice immersion based learning on a semester basis and gain college credit for it. And so that is a, a full-fledged accredited college program. And so these young students have this amazing opportunity to, they earn full-time credit, they get 12 credit hours. And for on the semester system, they go to MA sessions um, every day, five days a week. And they do it for 15 to 20 hours. And then in the afternoons, they do an internship where it's some sort of language related task where it's helping them supplement their learning. And so a student can go through four semesters of this, which is two school years, right? If they have that on top of their gen eds finish, they will have a Bachelor of Arts in Tribal Languages with a focus on their own language. So basically it's allowing a student to um, study their own language in, for full time credit and get a BA for it in place of um, doing that instead of just you know doing it on their own or not getting any credit for it or trying to sacrifice you know go back and forth between a job, if somebody can afford to be a full time college student and is able to fulfill you know that level of commitment, they're able to learn their language full time, and that is actually in an immersion based environment, which I'm going to comment on in a in a minute because that there is a difference between you know I feel like there is there is a difference between the linguistics aspect and immersion, like we heard a lot about that today too. So that's what I'm learning and talking about too. Well, let's see. And the location, so these, it's four different tribes that do it. Meskwaki is gonna be the fifth location. And so my, my job, basically my, um, my work for my employer is I'm um, doing the implementation and development of the Meskwaki location in my own community. So my, um, some of the tasks that I have been do working on is one, establishing community buy-in. And I talked to, um, I've approached elders, I've approached um, some clan leaders and our tribal council and um, our Meskwaki language department, of course, I work closely with them and our higher, edu higher education department. I let people know what I'm working on. I just let, make them aware um, that this is a project that I was interested in. You know, in the beginning, I actually asked people kind of to get people's blessing before I accepted the position because I thought, well, if my community, you know, doesn't want to do this type of project, if my community really doesn't support it, then it's not something that I want to be a part of if they really don't feel like this is, you know, a viable thing that we should do. So I kind of wanted to see people's, you know, response first. So I did that. And over the months and year, I've been talking to more and more people and explained to them, you know, this is where it's at and this is an idea, you know, do you, how do you feel about this collaboration? And people are really supportive. So that's been really good. I'm, I'm lucky that I've had nothing but support and nobody has given me any sort of objections about it. Um, another um, task that I do is um, training to be the intermediate person. In the traditional master apprentice um, program, there's typically just the elder speaker and then the learners. And in this one, they have begun to modify it just based on their experience because they've been doing this for years and years. There will be an intermediate person, and in our case, that will be me. I'm going to be responsible for learning. Um, I've learned curriculum development, developing topics that we um, that will pursue through our activities. I learned how to develop the language learning activities. And um, one project I just recently did was basic immersion phrases, which I'm going to be responsible for doing you know, on my own because the setting will be basically you have the learner and the speakers, and then I'll be in the go-between where I'm the one guiding, I guess, what topic we're going to do that day and what activity we're going to do, and I'll be the one to um, kind of initiate that conversation and help elicit that out of those fluent speakers. So, um, but we want to do that all in the language. You know, we, we can't allow English to be what elicits that language out of them. So, so those basic immersion phrases are what I'm getting a grasp on. Basically things like when you greet people and walk into the room, let's all sit down and let's, okay, let's start now. You know, um, just all these, every little thing I can think of that I might say in a session where I'm not allowed to speak English for three hours, you know, what, am, what do I need to know at the basic minimum? So um, that's one project. I'm still kind of working on that one. 
And then securing a location, that was a, a big project. And I finally got commitment from our K-12 school. They gave me a classroom space. So I feel really official now. I'm so excited. I have actually a, a very large, um, generous amount of classroom space within our, our school. And it's right in the same um, area of our um, culture and language teachers. So I'm really happy about that. And as soon as that location is available, which will be in the next month or so, um, I'll be able to move in and be, be really official and start recruiting people, you know, recruiting our elders and recruiting the learners who will participate in this program. And um, developing curriculum, yeah, that's, so that's what I'm working on now. Um, for anybody who might be curious about how that collaboration works between our two um, communities, this is a summary of it. In our Meskwaki community, we have fluent speakers available. The Sauk language community is, um, their interest in this and their interest in helping us have a successful program lies in the fact that they only have one fluent speaker that they're able to work with at this time. Um, and she's um, aging, uh, she's over 80 years old. And so, you know, once she's no longer available for them to work with, once she's gone, you know, they're, they're really not gonna be able to advance their own learning. Um, from you know a, a communicative approach, it'll just strictly be anything that they had a chance to record with her while she was here. So um, I know that they're they're very motivated to develop a relationship with us and to get that collaboration going because eventually you know our our language is one and the same. Almost all of our words are the same. The grammatical structure is identical. So it's it's just about only as different as maybe like. British English and American English, maybe something like that, to that level of difference. I don't know. Sometimes it's it's just feels and sounds exactly the same, and sometimes their their intonations are a little bit different. Um, but it's mutually intelligible. It's the same language, and so they're gonna eventually, you know, need to spend time in our community. So it's to their benefit that we have successful programming too. Um, so I do um, consultation sessions with our Meskwaki speakers as we do another proje project that I'm um, helping with for that department. Let me see anything I left out. Yeah, so the SOC program, Jacob and um, the other staff, the younger learners are helping me. They've been training me, giving me, you know, tips on this is how we run immersion sessions. You know, this is how we do it. Um, I'm learning a lot about that from them, and so it's been it's truly, truly a partnership because we each bring um, we each bring strengths to the setting. Uh, let's see, what time is it? I want to ask because I think we started a little bit late, but I'm counting down to giving myself forty minutes. Okay, I'm gonna. F I just want to fly right through because I want people to discuss too. Um, let's see. Oh, so a few other projects that I have helped with to contribute, that I've been able to contribute due to, you know, my linguistics experience is, one, we made a fieldwork protocol. So we have, you know, we know that we're amassing hundreds and hundreds of um, audio files. So we made a fieldwork protocol and that specifically one thing is um, a file naming convention. Um, it's just, it doesn't seem like that big of a deal at first, but once you have hundreds of audio files, you know, you have to categorize them somehow. You have to have a way to find what you're looking for. So building like a finding item and a reference like, okay, here's the index. Here's how we're gonna find something that might include this topic or this type of, whether it be an elicitation or a story, a word list, um, or a conversation. A narrative, you know, there's different types of recordings that we do, right? And then there's, you know, you can categorize it by who you were working with, or the date and time, you know, when you were working on it, or the type of project it was. So um, I helped develop the the protocol for that. Um, another thing is we just basically do some. I've done some basic field work. Um, fresh out of school, like my, my favorite class at school was field methods, of course, where we got to work with a fluent speaker. My language was Malay, um, which is an Austronesian language, and that was really, it was so cool to work with a language I had never heard before, <laughs> and um, to be expected to learn, you know, how to work with that speaker and elicit some of that um, grammatical structure from her. It was, it was quite an exercise, and it was so fun, and um, I'm really happy to be able to be back and do that in my own community now. Now that I know how to do that, you know, more efficiently than I used to be able to do back when I just had language tables. 
um, before I had studied linguistics, it was a different output that came out of my language tables, and now it's it's more structured and, and targeted towards those verb types that that we need to know. Um, but a really big project for the department is standardizing immersion, and that's basically amassing all the information that they've gathered as far as best practices for immersion. They want to pull all their files together. Um, the way I'm helping to contribute to that is uh, we're going to document as many verb types as we can for as long as we can, and it will take years and years because we have um, we have 26 different what we call moods in Meskwaki, so that's like if you take a verb, any verb, like um, looks, he looks at, there's 26 different ways that we can um, change that verb to reflect a certain semantic notion or um, convey a certain um, setting or scenario, put it into a certain context as to, you know, whether it, it did happen or it didn't happen or it might happen or should happen, you know, those are just some examples. But we have 26 different ways that we can change that verb for um, different reasons. And it makes it really complex. I mean, there are, so there's thousands of possibilities, but we got to start somewhere, you know, and we do have, we have a pretty good start. And some of it we all know, like some of them are really easy. And the funny part is, the one we're working on right now is actually, um, did I put that in here? The one we're working on right now is imperatives. And imperatives, um, basically command words like, look at him or look at me. Um, that is one thing that in their community, unfortunately, they, they, weren't, they weren't fortunate enough to grow up in homes where they had fluent speakers talking to them and giving them these commands as children, whereas in our community, that's a big part of what we know. <laughs> that's one thing that our people my age are really good at is probably imperatives. You know, we know how to command each other to do this and that. You know, that's where we heard a lot of that language, you know, spoken to us like in that way. So, so we have that, but they don't have that in their, their understanding. And from their immersion sessions, that was kind of a gap. You know, they just, they haven't got to that yet. They, they haven't heard a lot of it. So that was a priority for them. And for me, I think, oh, okay, that's really easy, right? That's so easy. It's the simplest thing. So I'm really happy it kind of worked out that way. Like, it's giving me a chance to put together, you know, put forward our process, get my process down, and um, look at how, how this is going to work out, our, our collaborative um, fieldwork process. So... Um, what we're going to do is once we have samples, at least recordings, just a sample recording of all these different moods, is put them into a reference guide for ourselves. We're building our own material. We're building our own reference um, handbook. And this is, we'll have at least, you know, we'll have at least one sample of every verb. You know, that's the goal. That really is the goal. And I, like I said, there are thousands of ways that we can manipulate these verbs, but, you know, we're going to do it. We have to. We really don't have a choice, and we're going to document them all so that, you know, going forward, we'll always have that to go back to once we're left on our own. Heaven forbid if that should ever happen. Hopefully it doesn't, but, um, you know, we need to get those documented. So um, in, sum in summary... Um, yeah, the linguistics, like we talked about today, yes, linguistics doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be good at doing pedagogical material. I mean, you don't just, they're, they're not the exact same thing. However, it can really inform it. It can really um, shape, you know, what it is that you're delivering through, even through immersion sessions. So I'm using it, you know, to build my, my curriculum and my immersion sessions, thinking of a starting place. It, it really does. It really does give me a blueprint. So it's, it's completely essential. Um, another thing that I want to make a point about is that I think as adult learners, we really do have a, um, you know, they say the critical period when children are young, it takes, um, as, as the years go by, it takes a little bit more effort for us to acquire that language, whereas babies can pick it up very naturally. Um, you know, we're no longer babies, so it is going to be harder for us to pick up everything. And I've witnessed it with a lot of learners, you know, that I've seen, you know, we don't even in myself, I don't catch everything, but sometimes when there's a linguistic concept that I, I've read about it and I know about it now, I'll start to hear it. You know, I hear it when people are talking. I'm like, oh, there's that thing. You know, I just, I'll catch it. Whereas had I not studied linguistics and been aware that the concept even existed, I never would have heard it. It would have been like in one ear, out the other. And I still see that happening a lot, you know, with a lot of adult learners. So um, just having that awareness of anything will help you um, 
help with our language acquisition. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so those are, those are the points I wanted to make. Um, I really did want to leave time open because we had such a good discussion today and I felt like people had really legitimate good ideas and they were sharing. So I just want to encourage anybody who has comments or questions to just feel free to speak up now. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. The first time is more of a, a, a comment and a, and a thing that, that helped me a lot is um, something you said at Colang 2014 and you were talking and you said that um, kind of it, it called the whole audience to remember that, that this year or, or you know every year it's somebody's first year learning the language. Yeah. And so something that you might think is tired or that maybe you're tired, um, it's new to somebody else and to, um, to remember to, to be inspired. And I, I, I'm, I'm liking what I've seen here. I'm very inspired by the approach of Master Apprentice um, associating it with college credit and a college degree. Yeah, their their um, their first two interns, their young learners, they stayed with the program for five six years, and they had to forego their studies. They were college, they were university students at one point, and that's the age that they joined. But they had to drop out because they were so committed to their language learning, and it took them being full time employees or you know interns at the language program to become as fluent as they are. Yeah, they're conversationally fluent. They are, they're doing it. One fascinating thing that I thought this was so cool, when um, we were doing the imperatives chart, they provided, so they did, they create some of the charts and then they send them up to me. Mm -hmm. And then I will go and um, work with the fluent speakers. But one thing I noticed was that they are well aware of like VTAs, VTIs, and VAIs. They, they understand that structure, but the way the, the ones who are building it, they're conversational people. And it didn't, it just came out very naturally for them to make their word list. And whereas me looking at it through this, you know, perspective, I was like, oh, I need to rearrange this and put it into like, I need to put my mathematical relations in between all of them. And that was really funny to me because I'm like, okay, so, you know, they have their strength. Their strength is they're conversational. I'm not as conversational. But at the same time, when I did it that way, I found some patterns that they had missed. And I was like, oh, we would have missed this had we not had it organized out this way. And then I did like, uh, yeah, there were, there were a few paradigms that we surely would have missed had I not reanalyzed it. So it's like true teamwork, true collaboration. And there, you know, there's a going back and forth. We can influence each other. Hi, yes. So if you were to choose between, because I know like our college, and Fort Winnipeal, they do teach, like, yeah, I think they teach in the languages. Um, so we have three languages, but I know like they teach about the man and, um, and then so would you prefer like, because there's usually like a teacher and then the students and then as, you know, compare that to like a master apprenticeship, would there be too much of a difference in like what, what would you have for and then why? Yeah, um, I know just having known these guys for um, as much as I have, the constant message that they give is you really need that intensity and that focus on smaller groups of people, which it's, it's unfortunate because our resources are limited, but the true growth comes when you really allow for a master apprentice approach where it's a very small group and they are dedicated for hours and hours each week. Th that's where you see the results. I honestly think that there's, there's a reason why we haven't seen results in large classroom delivery type of teaching. So is uh, when they do, like when they do a semester and they do the, um, the master apprenticeship, do you guys set a limit on that then? The, you know, we, I don't think they've had to say, okay, we can't, you know, accept any more people because they haven't had that large number of people make that level of commitment yet. But yes, it's not going to be able to get larger than like four students. But I, I honestly feel like, you know, I'm not sure that I'll get three or four students commit. I'm hoping to get one or two and I'll be so happy if it's one or two. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I mentioned that I'm also part of a uh, master apprenticeship um, for Hidalgo language. Oh. And I know um, at the very end, like 
major which is this class and I don't really so I don't really know too much about like the physics and but um and I know you're talking about um kind of being like the um like the liaison or between like those figures and like the apprentices. So yeah. and I know like one of our problems was sometimes it's hard to um kind of create like that momentum and keep the motivation going when it's like okay what do we do now? And then yeah. I know like um, we go to our food speakers and they're like, oh, um, they won't, I, I say, you know, just start speaking an answer, but they don't want to because they know that we don't know how to. And yeah. And only they'll just say, they'll just say, oh, um, well, tell us what you want to know. And then it's like, <laughs> well, what, I want to know what you want to know. And everything. <laughs> and then they want, you know, so it's the same of, in my community and my family. It's the exact same. It's exactly the same. Tell me, so like, maybe if there's tips or something where we just kind of keep the ball rolling. And yeah. I know I try to have a topic centered around. But then sometimes, you know, then we'll just, they'll just put out words and phrases and then we're writing them down or recording them. And then after that, it's just like we're just sitting there. So I don't know, maybe if you had anything. That's, that's where that grammatical structure comes into play. So like anybody who teaches, whether it be like a Japanese class or a Spanish class, you know, those Spanish teachers, you know, they've taken, um, Spanish grammar, like they understand how this structure, you know, what, what to teach first and what more is left to teach, like how those conjugation charts look, you know, they, they already have this idea in their mind of what needs to be delivered and what they have an idea of what it is that you don't know. And so that's where, that's my role right now. And thank goodness we have documentation where I don't have to go and discover all that on my own because some languages are really understudied right now. And I don't know the status of MHA you know, I don't know how much documentation you guys have, but uh, but you need it though. You, you have yeah, to. Somebody's got to be able to guide it and shape where you're going. I think. Do you have any input on that? On you know, informing the direction of your MA sessions by? Um, yes. Um, so some like. Um, through the um, IPOLS uh, and the uh, Advocates for Indigenous California Language Survival, they would put the learner, the apprentice, like they'd be told, "You're that's your responsibility mm -hmm. is to is to have topics prepared, and then be ready for the master speaker to take off and go in some other direction." Yeah. Um, <laughs> Also to have um, some phrases to bring it back into the language. Um, you know, panalohi, we say, please say that in our language. And then learn ones that, like, we started out by learning ones that were kind of, they were, they were based on English expressions and actually rather rude in Karuk. Um, and politeness is a thing. Mm -hmm. So um, we learned, you know, that brought out the chance to come up with the older, more appropriate ways of drawing out information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like having an intermediate person who already was like more fluent than yourselves to guide your activities would have helped? I, yes, I, I've a couple of times suggested that we like develop programs around having a, a language coach because sometimes we get discouraged after a while or we hit a plateau. Mm -hmm. So, so having a coach is <laughs> terrific. Um, and now, because we have less speak, less first language grown-up speakers than we used to, we rely on second language adult learners. And so, um, so we get together in, in pods more, so groups of people mm -hmm. um, between two and six people. Mm -hmm. I think somebody who is aware of what that language structure is like is really essential to, to any learning scenario. And you know, as fluent speakers, we don't, we don't, we don't know that. We don't have that until you, you somehow studied it. And that study comes from you know, somebody who had a linguistics you know, mind to apply to that. I think every, every resource out there for language has been touched by a linguist. You know, like a, a, textbook, a Spanish textbook, or something like that. Like, I'm sure a linguist was behind that. Yeah, the one grammar and cutting was written by Bill Bright, and that's why I went to graduate school. It wasn't because I loved linguistics. In fact, I was terrified of it. <laughs> um, but I wanted to be able to read his book, and so I said, well, this is, this is what I'm doing. Mm -hmm.
I was still terrified for you know for a long time too. I mean, it is. It's there's a lot to know. I will never we'll never know everything. Yeah. <laughs> There'll be LSA participants, you know, here this weekend, and I'm like, I have no idea what it is that you do. Like, I don't even understand. <laughs> And, and, you know, they, they'll come probably here and be like, how does this apply to me? <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't apply to you. This is specifically for my tribe. Yeah, it's a different approach that we do, but it's, it's very valuable, the information in linguistics. Is it? Um, it is. It's 205. Um, Jacob, um, he was going to offer, I know that um, the Ojibwe folk, Anishinaabes, wanted to meet with him, so we were gonna just casually meet ourselves, get together at two o'clock. Um, but he, Jacob said, um, tell anybody who else wants to come if they wanna you know, ask questions and stuff, because I know a lot of people like to meet with Jacob. They like to approach him and pick his brain. So if anybody wants to join us, we'll be next door right, right now, it looks like.